welcome and thanks for joining us. Uh, please let me introduce the course and also introduce myself. So what we are going to talk about um, within this four days period, we will talk about convex analysis. But not the standard one, we, uh, we would like to focus on a very specific space, which is called the geodesic space. Okay, and by the way, just to introduce myself again, I am Parin Chai Panya from KMUTT, King Mongkut's University of Technology, Thonburi. Um, I'm from Bangkok, Thailand. And this topic have been, has been my main research topic for more than five years, I think. And it's still a very young topic. Um, it was, uh, it was officially born, I think, less than 20 years or at least 25 or something like that. Okay, and it is the topic where I also um, studied when I was a PhD student. And by the way, um, before, before we start, I have to thank um, SIMPA Research in Paris for granting me um, this opportunity to, to participate, to do research and to give this course and um, again, before we begin, um, since we don't have the lecture notes right now, I, I will try to implement the lecture note and put it online in the website of SIMPA. And as well, I will put it in my private website if you care to uh, visit and download it later. Just my name and surname, glued together and .com. So after a week or two, I think you, you will be able to find my lecture there. Okay, so let's get into the topic. I will first um, give you a short introduction of convex analysis in geodesic spaces. So the first two questions that I am going to address is what is convex analysis in geodesic spaces and why do we need to consider this? Okay, so convex analysis serves as um, um, a basis or a foundation for optimization and also for uh, variational inequalities and their generalizations and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> geodesic space, okay, that was convex analysis and now the geodesic space um, you can you can think of this geodesic space as a very general uh, framework that allows us to talk about um, line segments that join between two points and therefore the very definition of convexity itself. Um, why do we need to go this far to this generality? Well, there are two main reasons. The first is from the application point of view. Um, as you might have noticed, the optimization theory, convex analysis, monotone operator theory have been much generalized recently into the setting of manifolds and beyond. Um, thanks to the study of data science, um, machine learning or data analysis or, or, or anything in that branch that gave um, very important practical applications to this kind of studies in geodesic spaces. And actually geodesic space is more general than a, a manifold. So we, 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 we don't have the, the luxury of, of having the smooth structure or differential structure. So we have to attack the problem purely in, in, in terms of geometry. Um, that is the first motivation from, uh, 
from application point of view. And the second motivation from theoretical point of view is that uh, we can do quite a lot of things when, when we consider manifold structure. And that is because of the smooth structure or differential structure that a manifold has. But when we step out, when we step backward to this case of uh, geodesic space, we don't have such a tool. So it's kind of interesting how to overcome this lack of tools. And instead of attacking the problem analytically, we need to attack them geometrically instead. And um, you will see throughout my lecture that um, many of the results are still true, are still possible when we generalize them to the setting of geodesic space. Actually, um, it's not the general geodesic space that I am going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the cat kappa space, which is a very specific kind of geodesic spaces. And um, Okay, so to know what works well is one thing. And the other thing is to know what goes wrong in this setting. So it is not a direct generalization in a sense. Um, not all the results will be generalized straightforwardly into this kind of spaces. Some, some of them do, but many of them do not. So in this course, we also address the similarity and the differences um, that we have between these general geodesic spaces and what we have in the manifolds or in a, a, a linear spaces. Uh, so what to expect from, from my lecture and what not to expect. So what to expect is you, you will see a lot of ideas, how, 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 how the results are generalized and are relaxed in this um, setting. And what you will not see that much is the proofs. So my aim is not to prove everything, to give the proof to every theorem, to every pro proposition, to every lemmas. So you will only see the main results basically, and you will not see the technical lemmas, technical proposition behind these um, theorems that I'm going to present to you in these four days. So let me give you a very quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. So um, first I'm going to talk about geodesic space, of course, because we need this. We will talk about many things here, and this is the purpose of today's lecture. Is it too small? No. Um, next thing I will talk about is the convexity. Okay. And the next thing, apart from convexity, we will talk about some fixed point theory. Next, we will talk about um, optimization algorithm. Okay, so what did I call it? I call it proximal. Okay, for functions. And five, we will finally, five, we will talk about vector fields, or I will call it the first order theory. So I have to confess that eight hours is, is not small, it's, it's quite a lot, okay? But um, after I try to prepare, the lecture, I, I, I think, ooh, all of these things in eight hours, mm, this is huge. But okay, let's, let's try to go for all of these. Since we are not going to prove 
um, the time can be reduced quite a lot. Um, do we need to address anything here? Okay, so as I said to the, today, we are going to do some revision. I will introduce you the geodesic space and the CAT Kappa space, the main ingredient that we will be using. Tomorrow, we will cover the convexity and fixed point theory, hopefully. And it's not the whole um, fixed point theory in this space. We will only um, focus on the part that will be applied to convex analysis. So the first, first thing that I would like to, to apply this fixed point theory to is um, to study the convex feasibility problems, which we, we talk about um, uh, the products of, 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 uh, of, of metric projections. And it can also help a little bit, not a little bit, it also help in the study of proximal algorithms, which we will talk on Wednesday. And finally, on Thursday, we will talk about the first order theory. Uh, there are some standard references for, for, for these uh, topics. If you want to study geodesic spaces and some property regarding the convexity in this space, a uh, very standard text would be um, the text by Burak, Bur to Burago and Ivanov. So I call that BBI. It's, it was published by uh, the AMS. Another one, a little bit newer, would be the, the textbook by Whitson and, and Hedlinger. Um, there were newer one like um, an invitation to cat zero spaces or something like that by um, Stefani Alexander, Anton Pretunin and so on. And another one which is very nice covering the four topics here, the first four, is the book by Miroslav Bakak, um, Convex Optimization in Hadamard Spaces, something like that. And the fifth topic, it's quite new, it just published it this year. Um, there is no standard text for this, but you can consult, for example, my paper in numerical functional analysis and optimization. Okay, so these are all that we are going to talk about in this four days. Okay, so let us begin with the first one, which is the geodesic spaces. Okay. Okay, so I, I hope you all know you all know about metric space. So I suppose right now that X is a metric space. I always suppose at this stage that um, XD is a metric space. Okay, then first we need to define what we consider as a curve on a metric space. So a curve on X is any map, any continuous map C define on some compact interval, let me call that AB. This is a compact interval in the real line into X. Okay, very general. We don't ask anything more. Okay, a curve is just any continuous map C defined on a compact interval of R into the space X. X here is a metric space. So we can 
we can talk about continuity here because we have the topology here. Good. Uh, so we don't ask anything about this curve. It can have self-intersection. It can, okay, you can have self-intersection like this or even more uh, confusing like this. And here is CA and here is CB. And we call these two points the endpoints of the curve. Okay, so we call these endpoints. Okay, not only that, we allow the curve to stop at some moment and then continue towards CB. For example, we can define CA here and we um, we proceed from A towards B. So T, T in this interval is moving from B, uh, from sorry, from A towards B, but it needs not uh, continuously, I, I mean, it needs not to be moving all the time. Sometimes you can have like stop here for a while. So for example, A to some T1 and then T1 to T2, you stop here and then T2 onward, you start moving again. So we allow this kind of things. We, we still call these curves. And when we have the curve uh, defined on a metric space, we cannot use calculus to define the curve length so we have to use the metric. We have to define the length of this curve C in terms of the metric. So the length okay, of C, C is this curve. Um, let me specific of the curve C. C, define on C to A, B into X. We define this by using this formula. We use L to denote the length. Uh, not so clean. We take it to be um, the supremum of the summation. Distance between C T I to C T I plus one. Can you see? Okay. Okay, so from I equals to zero up to N minus one. And what what supremum do we take over? We take this supremum over all the partitions. So we require A to be equals to the first T0, and then we have a strictly increasing finite sequence up to Tn, which is B. Okay, so we have the partitions of this interval AB defined in the finite sequence T0 up to Tn for some um, integer n, positive integer n. Okay, so what, what exactly is this length. So, 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 so first you can, you can observe using the triangle inequality that uh, the more, the finer, the finer the partition, the lengthier this, um, I mean, this quantity will be larger if the partition is finer due to the triangle inequality. So what we actually do is we take Okay, suppose this is T0, T1, T2, 
T2 and so on up to finally Tn. And then we measure the distance using the distance function itself using D. So you have the distance between um, CT0 to CT1. Then you add it by the distance between C at T1 to C at T2 and so on. So this is the summation. Okay. And you keep, keep doing this kind of partitions all the possible ways and you take the supremum. Okay, so this is how you define the, the curve of, of uh, uh, sorry, the length of a curve in a general metric space. Good. And okay, since we are taking the soup, we are taking the soup here. There is nothing to, to guarantee that this supremum will be finite. Okay. I need to move towards this side. Okay. Okay. So since in the definition we take the supremum, uh, there is no guarantee that this quantity will be finite. It can be uh, it can be infinite as well. So if LC is finite, then we call we say that C is rectifiable. Okay, so, so when the length of the curve C is finite, then we say that that curve C is rectifiable. Since we do not ask any additional property rather than continuity for a curve, um, you can simply find an example of a non-rectifiable curve. Uh, you can find a, a rectifiable curve even in the compact space for example if we take let's, let me call this example one if we take x to be 0 to 1 the taking to be the Euclidean um, the Euclidean distance um, induced on this uh, subset. That means the distance is uh, measured by using the straight line and we define a curve C from 0 to 1 into x. Of course x is again 0 to 1 and define this C to be any curve such that Let me write down it first. Okay, so we can define a rectify a non-rectifiable curve like this, even though in this. Okay, so even though 
the space X is uh, compact. So we define C like this. C is defined on um, a compact interval 0 to 1 into X. And we don't need to specify this. We just need this to be any curve such that when you take the value at Ti, okay, when you take the value of uh, at Ti, the position of this CTI will be exactly at this point. Of course, this, is, this belongs to interval 0, zero to 1. <clears throat> okay, and we require one more thing. Ti here must be a sequence that sums up to 1. Okay, for example, this can be 1 over 2 to the power of i plus 1 or something like that. So 1 over 2 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 8 and so on. Okay, that can be um, the sum of Ti that will sum up to 1. And if you, ca if you compute the, here, if you compute the distance between CTI to CTI plus 1, it will be, it will be 1 over i plus 1. And when you take the sum, uh, sorry, when you take the sum, as the partition goes finer and finer, it goes to plus infinity. So this is not a rectifiable curve defined on a compact set. What can we say about uh, the length of a curve related to the metric D? Because, because here the, the metric D is not taking to be the length of any path of any curve. Okay, you can just define it to be, for example, the discrete metric. So discrete metric, metric is either zero or one. So you don't have curve between any two points and you cannot really measure the length of, I mean, you can measure it like this. So it's either zero or plus infinity. But uh, the distance itself does not come from the length. Okay, so one observation. So observe that the length of the curve C is always larger than or equals to the distance between the two endpoints. So let me call it CA and CB. We have this for sure due to the triangle inequality. Okay. Now, as I told you, since this distance, the, the original one, is not coming from any length, we want to regularize them because not coming from, from a length is not natural in, in, in our applications. So I want to to come up with another another um, distance, distance. Okay, so so we will define another distance based on the notion of the length of a curve. Okay, so for each. for each x and y inside x. We define d bar between x and y to be um, the infimum of LC. Okay, and, and then the infimum is taken all over the curve C whose endpoints are x and y. All right. So from, 
for any two points x and y we can draw we can draw several several curves joining them for example like this or this and so on so we just don't want to take any curves we want to take the curve that um, in a way it is the shortest one but actually that curve might not exist of course so we, we, we instead we, we, we instead of taking the min we're taking the inf so in this case maybe it's this one uh, the one which looks more straight this curve let me call it c bar might be the shortest um, curves between the two points x and y and this c bar will be the value of this d bar of x and y because this is the length um, i mean the length of this curve is the shortest among the curves that join that connecting x and y together okay so so this is more or less the idea but actually what is really happened is in some metric spaces uh, the curve c bar might not exist that is one thing that might happen and another case also very extreme uh, the curve c, c bar the the, the shortest, shortest curve might be not unique so for example if you have if you have a sphere or circle let it be a circle for now and you take an antipodal point anti antipodal points mean uh, the straight line from x to y will pass through the origin okay if you if you if you define x to be this um, circle this is called s1 this um, circle and you draw a curve from x to y which is the shortest there will be two which is this curve above and this curve below so in this case the shortest curve might be not unique but exist okay so 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 let me let me show you the case where uh, the shortest curve might not exist Okay, we take x to be a punctured R2, like the Euclidean plane, and I take the origin outside. And of course, d is still the Euclidean. So the space looks like this. Suppose this is R2. Actually, there is no boundary, but let's draw it. Okay and this is the origin there is no origin because i take this out okay and then i take two points here maybe minus one zero and here one zero so a curve in this x okay you have to delete this point so a curve that that runs from minus one zero to one zero let, let me call this x and y cannot pass through the origin because this is not in the um, in the space so the curve can be something like this or like this so any curve that avoids the origin this also counts but well, if you take the infimum among these curves, you still get the Euclidean distance between x and y because you can, you can take the green line like this and you, you make it flatter and flatter, closer and closer to the origin. And so the, 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 the length of these kind of curves will converge towards the Euclidean distance between x and y. So 
So in this case, uh, d, d here, which is the Euclidean distance, coincides with this d bar. Okay. And here is the theorem concerning d bar. If you wonder, okay, what d bar is, we have a proposition. Uh, so d bar defined like this is a metric function. Okay. So if you want to prove, you can you can try to prove it yourself. But as I informed you, this course is not about 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 proofs. So I will I will just not prove this, but let you know that okay, if we define d bar to be the infimum of the length, this is a metric on x. But we have to make precise what kind of metric it is. I will make a remark later, but. For now, let's just call this d bar metric on x. Um, and we have d bar is always larger, always larger than or equals to d, the original uh, metric. Okay, so this metric d bar is called. the length metric induced by D. Okay, because, because in order to, to define the length, first we need the original metric D, and this original metric D gives birth to the notion of L, the length, and this notion of length gives birth to the notion of d bar. And we can show, if you'd like, that d bar is a metric on x. Metric here means um, it is zero if and only if the two points input inside this function are identical. Um, you can change the position, they are symmetric. And it satisfies the triangle inequality. So that um, d bar is a metric, but we have to be very careful at this point because it can occur that between two points you cannot find a rectifiable curves. And so if there is no rectifiable curves between the two points, that means this infimum will be plus infinity, will not be finite, right? Because you define it to be the infimum of the length. If there is no rectifiable curves connecting them, then LC is always plus infinity and the infimum is plus infinity. So d bar here is a metric. If we allow um, the definition of a metric to include the value of plus infinity, excuse me. All right. So let's let's go back to this example. Let us call this example two. Let's go back to this. If we try to construct d bar out of this metric d, you will uh, see that d bar here is actually d. So this is. Uh, this is already a length metric. So from this proposition, from this proposition, we can see that d bar is in general larger than or equals to d. Okay, so d bar is larger than or equals to d. 
but there is no guarantee that d bar and d will be equal. Okay. So in this example, example two, as I mentioned, you have d bar and d identical to each others. Great, but that is not always happen. So we have a very special definition here saying that if d bar and d are equals, then we say that this original metric space, which is, of course, if you change it to be d bar, it's still the same, it's still the original one. Then we say that this metric space is a length space. Okay, it's a length space because the distance itself is measured using the length of a curve. Okay, the shortest length of a curve or the length of the shortest curve or whatever that you um, feel comfortable about. Okay. Okay, so this is the definition of the length space. Now, let me go to the main definition of the talk here because we, uh, uh, the name of the talk is geodesic space. I mean, one part is geodesic space. So what exactly is a geodesic? As I drew earlier over there, that we don't ask anything about a curve. So it can, it can cross itself, it can decide to stop if, they, if it wants, but that is, that is not what we want, okay? That's um, too general. We want something more regularized. So we come up with another definition So a curve, of course, a curve means it's continuous from the first place, defined on some compact interval into x. We call this curve a geodesic if you can find a constant, okay, let me call it M, a non-negative constant, such that if you measure the distance between CS and CT, this will be exactly the same as m times the absolute difference between s and t. And this have to hold for every choice of s and t. Oops. Okay, so this has to hold for every choice of S and T belong to um, the domain of the curve. Mm -hmm. So one thing that you can uh, observe from this definition is that this M here behaves just like um, kind of speed of the curve because if you take this, uh, this, this value, so let's say S and T are, dif are different for now, you take this um, quantity, you divide both sides by this, you have D of CS, CT divided by absolute value of S minus T equals to M, you take the limit as T tends to uh, S, you still have M, so that means a kind of speed of the curve is a constant M, okay? And this M cannot, actually it, it cannot be zero if um, the two endpoints, CA and CB are different. So we include zero here just for the case that 
C is the curve between X to itself. So it's a kind of constant curve, only a dot not going anywhere. So in that case, we allow M to be zero. Otherwise, it is false. You can show that simply that M cannot be zero in that case. Okay. So in other words, a geodesic here means a curve which has a, a constant um, speed. Someone will call this a, cons uh, a constant speed curve, but more simply, we call it geodesic. Uh, there are one remark here. If you are very into differential geometry, you, you, you may find the word geodesic as well, but that can, be, can mean different things. Um, in, in that uh, topic, a geodesic might refer to a curve, which is self auto parallel. If you take a kind of uh, connection or different uh, gradient or something like that, it will kind of parallel into itself. And here is not. This is more like minimizing geodesic if you compare the term between differential geometry and um, metric geometry. This is this kind of things are called metric geometry. Okay, and you you have forced another thing from this definition. It's a little proposition here that if C is a geodesic, um, it is the shortest curve. Is the shortest curve and of course this definition might not be relevant if you don't have no I should be here okay so this def this definition might not be so relevant so or should I say irrelevant if your metric mm, D is not a length metric Okay, a length metric just simply means that it makes XD into a length space. Okay. So if C is a geodesic, then it must be the shortest curve between the two endpoints. Period. Okay, so let's see what do we have. Okay, we have finished this. I'm kind of improvising. Okay, so one more thing. Okay, notice another thing from this definition. We don't ask anything about the domain. It can be just any compact interval in R. Okay, so that is not so convenient if you, if you want to apply this in, in a more general context. We will be using this definition of geodesic very, very often. Actually, this is the main definition that we need to use throughout the, the, the course. Uh, so, so we will, we will precise the domains. There are, there are two cases. Hello. Okay. So there are two cases of the compact interval AB that, that we are kind of prefer to use. So we add some regularities to the to the defining domain of the curve. Uh, geodesic. 
C is called what is this? No, here. Is said to be of unit speed. Uh, if C, okay. Okay, so very natural. Since we mentioned that m uh, is the kind of speed, so unit speed means the speed is one, is unit. Okay, so unit speed. And we ask for one more thing. Uh, that c is not defined on any interval a b, so we specify here that the geodesic is defined on zero to some. Mm, let's say capital M capital T is better to X okay so we specify here that only the geodesic that is defined on this type of domain will be called a unit speed if m equals to 1 and secondly we will call that this is normalized if m equals to the distance between the two endpoints okay so these are two um, regularities that we will be using because otherwise your geodesic will just define on whatever it likes and we cannot have some control over analysis of these uh, okay so if the geodesic C is of unit speed meaning M equals to 1 this will um, force automatically it, it will force that t becomes the distance between c0 and c of t likewise if you assume c to be normalized then this notion automatically implies that uh, t will be 1 okay so except one one case except the case that C and CB are the same point. In that case, you will not have T equals to one, but we prefer to have T equals to one anyway. Okay, so how about having a pause here for Something like five minutes. Hi right, guys, so let's continue. <clears throat> okay, before the pause, I talked about the two regularities that we are going to assume. So one of them will be used. And okay, so you might have some. Uh, questions about okay we have a geodesic we have a curve we have a geodesic and what then okay and I have to give you a note okay so I have to give you a note because well if you if we make, just make this kind of assumptions will it be appropriate will it we would reduce, we would narrow down uh, the usability, maybe. 
but I have to note here, let's call it, let's call it a remark. Uh, any shortest curve oh I, I, I don't need to emphasize this word any shortest curve meaning that okay so any shortest curve C meaning that this C uh, the distance be between CA and CB will be exactly the same as the distance between, uh, sorry, what did I say? The length of this curve will be exactly the same as the distance between CA and CB. Okay, that's correct. So any shortest curve C defined on this compact interval into X, any shortest curve mm -hmm, can be Reparameterized can be reparameterized into a GDC. Uh, of course, it is a GDC. Can be reparameterized into a unit speed or a normalized GDC. When I said it can be reparameterized into a geodesic, that is also correct. But we can do more. We can reparameterize it into either a unit speed geodesic or normalized geodesic as we wish. Okay? So according to this remark, using these two restrictions on the definition of a geodesic will not narrow down any perspective at all. Okay? Let me go back again to the to to my favorite example, the punctured R2. Uh, I think I called it example two. So if you look back into that, you have you have R2 but you delete the origin, so the origin is removed, okay? And as I said, that if we take two points here, minus one, zero, and one, zero, and we call this x, we call this y, right? There is no geodesic between x and y. There is no shortest curve between x and y, okay? Even though, if you take the infimum of the length of our curve connecting x to y, you get two, the length is two, but you will not be able to retrieve the minimizer. So the infimum in the definition of d-bar is not attained, okay? There is no minimizer, there is no shortest curve. Okay, so now we ask uh, what kind of space can we always have a geodesic or can we al always have uh, a shortest curve? Before that, let me call that space a geodesic space. Okay, we call this metric space a geodesic space if for any two points, x and y,
you can find a shortest curve between x and y. Or we can, we can say due to, due to this remark that we can also reparameterize a shortest curve into a geodesic, then we can say that there exists a geodesic um, connecting them. Okay, so this is, uh, with this notion, now we can, we can say things in a simpler manner. So go back to this, go back to this ex um, example. I can simply say that, okay, R2 punctured the origin uh, with the Euclidean distance is a length space because the distance can be recovered by taking the infimum of the length of the curves connecting x to y, any x to y. Okay, it is a length space, but it is not a geodesic space because between, for example, this x and this y, you cannot find the shortest curves in between them, connecting them. So this is not a geodesic space. Okay, so, so you cannot um, mix up between a length space and a geodesic space, okay? Length space, in length space, the distance is just recovered by the shortest, uh, the infimum of the curve length that connects x to y, but that infimum might not attain, that might not be attained. While in the geodesic space, the minimizing curve must, uh, must exist, okay? So that's the main difference. So you may ask, okay, one natural look to this, okay, if you delete this one point, then the space is not complete. Okay, and the attainment of, of a minimizer usually be related with the completeness of the space. That's one, one condition. Another one is the com compactness. So these two conditions are main criteria for um, a minimizer to, to exist. Okay, so one step first. So if you, if you have the completeness, will the length space be a geodesic space? Is, it, is, is the completeness enough, sufficient, to guarantee that that length space will be a geodesic space? Okay, so question, a big question. So is a complete, length space geodesic. So this is a big question. Okay, I cannot step beyond that boundary. Okay, is a complete length space a geodesic space? This is a kind of very natural question to, to, to ask. Because if you come back here, if you add back this point, this space is complete and you don't have the compactness. And if you add back, everything is fine. You have the geodesic space. While here, this question is quite relevant um, according to that example. So what is the answer for this? Mm, the answer is not so easy. And the answer is negative, of course. Otherwise, I will not raise this kind of question. Okay, so before, answer, um, before going more into this question, let me give you um, an affirmative answer, but of course, with, with, with a cost. Uh, we have a theorem. Maybe we can answer it first, and then stating a theorem. And the answer is no. So there exists a complete length space uh, 
which is not geodesic. But the counter example is extremely difficult to, to, to give, so I will not give it here. You can consult, I think, a, a textbook by Werner Baumann. I think they address this kind of um, question. If you look into, for example, Brits and Hefliger, which is quite uh, extensive in a sense, it still at least I checked it yesterday and I did not find uh, a counterexample. But it exists, I guarantee you it exists, but it is not obvious or not simple by any mean. And, okay, so since it's not, the next question to ask is under what assumption, what additional assumption can we put in here and make this complete length space of geodesic space? And, okay, compactness will be too strong, so we step back one one step and impose the local compactness on the space. I call it the theorem. Actually, it's a very big and it's a very well-known one. Uh, this is due to, actually the, the result is known as the hoff renoff theorem. So I should remark that the name and the the name hoff renoff theorem and the pro person who proved it are uh, different. The theorem is called hoff renoff but the, th uh, the, the one who proved the theorem are Cohn and Dawson. So I will give the reference here. Cohn and Dawson. I think they proved this theorem in 1975. And Hoff and Rinoff prove this similar theorem in, please uh, check by yourself, but I think it's 1972. And they prove this for, for surfaces. Okay, so not general metric space, but the metric space defined to be a surface. On, on a surface on R three. Okay, the theorem states as follow. Uh, a complete and locally compact length space. is geodesic. Okay, so we have two conclusions which is which which are both very important. So the first one is geodesic. Okay, so this this is the answer for this question. Okay, so to, to make this affirmative, we have to add the local compactness. And another thing which is very important as well is that um, this space is also proper. Proper in which sense? In the sense that every closed bounded subsets are compact. Okay. Okay, so if X is a complete locally compact length space, then first it is a geodesic space. This is very, very important. And second, um, 
the space is proper, is what we call proper metric space, which means that every closed and bounded subsets, of course, of this space are compact sets. Uh, as you know, in finite dimensional settings, um, the compactness and, and closed plus boundedness are the same, but that is not the same in general metric space, in infinite dimensional spaces. But when you assume the, uh, assume the local compactness on the space, then you recover this properness property. But this is to be used with a caution because whenever this uh, length space is a normed space, uh, when you impose the local compactness, that means that normed space is necessarily of finite dimensional. So you are going back to the to the finite dimensional settings. So you, you, you have this local compactness to, to, to retrieve two things, basically, which uh, first thing is the geodesicity, and the second thing is the properness. And the finite, finiteness of the dimension is, is the price for you to pay. It's not free. Actually, it's quite expensive, this condition. Okay, so, for now, these are things that you will need to know for a geodesic space. How to come up with a length metric, how to generate a length space out of a general metric space, okay, using the, the, the metric D bar. Now I will go on to the next topic, which will allow us to define um, a kind of synthetic curvature in general metric space. Not general, I mean in in particular metric spaces. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about right now is the modal space, spaces, spaces actually. The aim is we want to define um, the curvature on metric spaces. Normally you can define curvature on manifolds because it has the smooth structure or a differential, uh, differentiable structure. And what you use to define the curvature is calculus, okay? To some, to some, ex, to some generality, you use, uh, essentially you use calculus. So in order to define the curvature in metric space, you first have to know what kind of manifolds, um, how, 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 how curvature equals to kappa looks like, okay? So if you, if you know now that, okay, this kind of surface is of curvature equals to this, then you can try to compare the behavior of your metric space to this kind of uh, space that you know the curvature. That's why we call it modal space because we're kind of using um, this kind of um, spaces as the model of the curvature. Uh, okay, so the modal space actually is mn kappa so suppose n is the dimension and kappa is the curvature then we define mn Kappa, modal space of dimension n, curvature, sectional curvature equals to kappa. We have to specify which kind of curvature we are using, right? Because um, in a manifold, you have so many kind, so many types of curvature. You have sectional curvature, you have Gaussian curvature, Ricci curvature, so on. And you, you have curvature, which is not a scalar as well. Okay, so you define m n kappa. Kappa is the sectional curvature that we are going to use. We define this to be the complete simply connected Riemannian manifold whose sectional curvature is 
is exactly kappa, constant, constant sectional curvature. Okay, you can define it like this because at the end, if you come up with a, with a different kind of manifold, then it will be isometry to, the, to what we are going to define here. So you have three cases. The first case is Rn. Of course, Rn is the Euclidean space. You don't have any curvature to that. It's very flat, as flat as you wish. So this is um, the case where you don't have the curvature at all. Kappa equals to zero. Another case is when kappa is positive. In this case, well, I shall write Sn excuse my handwriting, Sn, but with a kappa here. So essentially, it is the n-dimensional um, sphere, but it can be shrinks or um, expanded, depending on the curvature. If you have a sphere, let, let us start with a unit sphere, and you shrink it. When you shrink it, you increase the, 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 uh, you increase the curvature, okay? Let's, let's imagine when you walk um, one centimeter in a large circle, it's still quite flat. But in a very small circle, one centimeter means a lot. You, you go down a curve quite a lot. So if you shrink the diameter of the, of the sphere, then the curvature will increase. This is, this is a very rough explanation, okay? But, but it works somehow like that. And for the case kappa is negative, you define this to be the hyperbol hyperbolic plane with kappa here. So this hyperbolic plane sometimes is referred to as the Lobachevsky plane um, because Lobachevsky is the one who studies this kind of space very manifold, very, very extensively. Okay. But actually, since we can expand or shrink, um, okay, we, we leave the Rn alone because that is the as trivial as you want. Okay, so we don't really bother about this. This is over, uh, already very simple, and you can I think you, don't, you 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 cannot simplify it further. But here, in the case of positive kappa, so since your modal space here is just the, the sphere shrink or expand it from the unit sphere, you can, some, you can somehow like consider only the case of kappa equals to one, okay? And that will give you, uh, give you the unit sphere. And for this case, kappa negative, you can do the same because this is just shrinking or, or, or expanding the Lobachevsky plane to obtain um, different curvatures, negative, okay? So actually, what you need to focus is on the case of kappa equals to zero, kappa equals to one, and kappa equals to minus one, okay? So if kappa is minus one, the Lobachevsky plane is uh, not shrink or not expanded. I, I think of the Lobachevsky plane as the sphere with the, uh, the radius negative i, negative imaginary unit imaginary number. <clears throat> of course, this is called the hyperbolic plane because the geometry on this, instead of using trigonometry like in um, the sphere, you need to use the hyperbolic trigonometry. Okay, so that somehow are related to this kind of geometry. So let's define, let, let us see something in in, in SN and also in HN, okay? In RN, we don't need to speak of anything. You already know that. So let me work with SN, okay? So what is here? Okay, let's consider this case, mn1, because kappa is one. 
So in this case, we consider the sphere. Let me recall you the definition. A n-dimensional unit sphere is the set of all x belongs to rn plus 1, okay? So, for example, S2 is the unit sphere, it's a two-dimensional surface embedded in the three-dimensional Euclidean space. Here is the dimension in the sense of a manifold. It's like standing on the Earth, Earth is three-dimensional, but on the surface, when you are here locally, you see things flat, just like two-dimensional. So that's a kind of two-dimensional sphere. And here we talk about n-dimensional sphere, which is embedded in n plus one dimensional Euclidean space. Um, this is the set of all x in that Euclidean space for which the norm of this x, the Euclidean norm, is actually one. So it's nothing more than the, the unit sphere. And we consider this, uh, consider this unit sphere with the length space, uh, sorry, the length metric Where we, we, where we will denote this as d kappa equals to 1, or for simplicity, dsn. The length metric dsn induced by the Euclidean distance. Okay, so essentially the unit sphere, n-dimensional unit sphere, is a subset of n plus one dimensional Euclidean space where the distance that we are going to use here is the distance which is the length metric induced from the Euclidean distance on Rn plus one. Okay, so now you have used the length metric but things are not so complicated, thankfully. We have an explicit formula for that length metric. Note that we have D S N between point X and Y. X and Y are uh, are from from the, the the sphere, okay? So distance between two points on the sphere can be computed to be the arccosine of the dot product between x and y. This form, uh, okay, arccosine, correct? All right, this is a very simple formula for the distance. So if you have a sphere, let's say this is three-dimensional sphere, you have a point X here, you have a point Y here, and um, the distance here is length metric, okay? The distance is measured by um, the shortest curve that connects X and Y, and this curve runs on X, okay? And of course you have here the origin, which is actually not, not on this sphere, it's the center. You have a sphere which is hollow, you don't include the origin, all. But somehow you can make use of the origin. You have X here, which is a point on the sphere, but at the same time you can consider this as a vector. Um, from the origin pointing toward this point x and also for the y. Mm, maybe I'm not choosing a good point. Oh, this is broken. Let me choose another y. Maybe it's better for illustration. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So x and y here, you take the product, which somehow measure the, the, um, the angle between these two vector, you take the arcosine, then you, um, actually the, the product is not the angle, but it reflects the angle, the sign of, the sign of this product reflects the angle. And <clears throat> taking the arcosine just give you the length here. Okay, so the length here is given by arcosine of the inner product or the dot product of x and y. And moreover, since this is the shortest um, curve, it is a geodesic in a sense. And you can define a geodesic in a very specific way. Okay, so so let's forget about let's forget about this y first, and you pick one x. Okay, so here is the origin, and here is the vector towards x, and then you can construct. A unit vector u belongs to uh, the orthogonal subspace generated from x. So what is this? This is just linear algebra, so I don't I don't want to repeat much. X per is the set of all vector v in the space. Here is Rn plus 1, such that the inner product between x and v equals to 0. Okay, this is the definition of x perp. So where is x perp here? Let me write it. Let me draw it green. So it's a plane. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not a Saturn, okay? So it's a plane that is cutting through the origin, and this plane is making uh, 90 degree with, um, with this vector x. And you take a unit vector u, any one from this x perp, so it's not just any vector on this plane, so you, you, you have to take it to be a unit vector. So you have to, to, to lie on the, on, on the surface, on the sphere, because it's unit. And it makes 90 degree angle between x and u. Let me call this u. And then from this, you can define a geodesic that runs from x and goes through u up to any point that you would want. Okay, so let me call this C A or C T. Demidifier. Okay, we define this CT to be cosine of T times X plus 
sine of t times u. Okay, so I broke one of the <laughs> eraser. Okay, let me write it in the same line. Okay, we can take this one and the domain of this function, I let it be ambiguity by on propose because actually you can define it up to like pi, up to t equals to pi if you'd like. And this, um, this curve will be a, a geodesic joining, of course, from x, joining any point that this curve pass through. Okay, so if, if you want to stop here and call it y, then you stop here at some, some t, some angle, okay? If it comes to this u, then is t equals to pi over two. If it comes all the way through its antipodal, then it's um, t equals to pi. So I, I will leave the domain of t to be this kind of um, ambiguity situation because you can define it up to the t that you want, up to capital T that you want, as long as t, capital T is less than or equals to to, um, to pi. Okay, so this this kind of function will give you a geodesic that you want. So, if you actually want to, um, okay, so so let me state it this way. This is a general definition of a geodesic because you don't come up with y first, you come up with x and you take any unit u in x perp. Uh, in practice, if you want to construct a geodesic that joins the two point x and y, you work a little differently. You pick x and you pick y, right? So you don't have u just yet. You take uh, the x perp, which is this green plane. You project this y onto this plane that will require quite um, a, quite a, a calculation but not not dif difficult so you project this y onto this point which is a point on uh, on this green plane green plane is the x perp right you project it so now let me call it py projected y and then you normalize this vector it will give you this vector u, okay? So normalized means you just divide this py by its norm. Then this point comes here and it acts as a u and you stop at t that you want, that t that makes ct equals to y. So this is the more practical construction, okay? And I have to note one more thing that uh, if, x and y, if the distance between x and y is less than pi, then they are joined by a unique Judicic. Okay, so this is all you need to know about the sphere for our purpose. We also need the case where kappa is minus one. And in this case, m n minus one here is just the hyperbolic plane, n-dimensional. 
In this case, we similarly we consider Hn, which again collects x from Rn plus 1, such that Q of x and x equals to minus 1, where we define this Q of x and y. Okay, let's call it Q for u and v. Defined by, no, defined by taking u1 times v1 plus up to un times vn. And since we are in n plus 1, we have one more coordinate, which is this. Okay, so it looks like an inner product, except for that the last coordinate you put on a negative sign. And we consider this equipped with <coughs> equipped with the length metric which is called the HN induced by the Euclidean distance on R N plus one. Okay, so similar things except for that, instead of inner product between xx, that is the same as norm squared, we use this instead of the inner product. This is called a quadratic form with a specific kind of matrix. Okay, so this is have to be minus one. And if we draw this, this will be a hyperbolic plane. This is just an asymptotic, okay? <laughs> Sorry for my poor drawing. Let me draw it again. Okay, so so you have as the asymptotic, the cone, okay, this is H2, higher dimension we cannot draw, and actually this is the asymptotic cone, if you'd like, this is given by um, x1 squared plus x2 squared minus x3 squared equals to zero. Okay, so this is the kind of, kind of thing. And for any two points here, here, you can define also a geodesic, which runs something like this. Mm -hmm. I will not go too much into the detail of, of this case because this case is not so much separated from the Euclidean space. Actually, we, 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 div we divide our, our spaces into two big cases. First is kappa greater than zero. The other is kappa less than or equals to zero. So we don't treat kappa equals to zero alone. We don't treat kappa less than zero alone unless there is, uh, there is some uh, motivations for that. And, and there are some, but let's forget about it now. Just focus on the construction here. Okay, so then um, this one is uniquely judicic. Ah, I forgot to, to mention that DHN can be simply computed. Uh, 
this can be computed as a kind of analog to this. So this is, uh, you, instead of taking the arc cosine, you take the arc hyperbolic cosine. And instead of the inner product or the dot product, you have to take a negative of q x y. So the negative, negative of q x y will be a kind of inner product for this kind of space. Because if you, if you compare, if you multiply minus 1 both sides, here you have minus qxx equals to 1, and minus q, minus q is behaving somehow similarly to the inner product there. Okay, so it's defined like this, and the geodesic um, from x will be constructed. by taking a u, of course, from rn plus 1, such that uh, q is minus 1, I think. I'm not sure. Where is my note? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so q u u equals to one. This kind of unit property, and you 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 should have something similar to the x perp, but here you have q uh, x x and u equals to zero. And you define and you define the geodesic bind This one will be the hyperbolic cosine of x plus hyperbolic sine u. Yep. <clears throat> okay, so back to this board once again. What you actually do is you Okay, <laughs> it's three-dimensional, it's very difficult to draw. So suppose you have just H1, H1 is a subset of R2. And you take X here, what is actually happening there is similar to this, it's isometrically similar. So you have um, a, tangent, a tangent line to this X, and you take u here, which is unit with respect to q, and then you define a curve in this direction with u. So this is what happened. If you go back to this case, then instead of having a tangent line, you have a tangent plane, but it's very difficult to draw here, so I prefer to reduce to the one-dimensional case. So you have the unit plane, and you, you can choose a kind of um, unit vector rotating around around x around here around the plane and you have u so if u is pointing downwards maybe you can define this red curve that joins x to y judicially okay
So now you, you know roughly what it looks like to have the sectional curvature equals to zero, equals to one, and equals to minus one. Now the final definition for today is the definition of an Alexandrov space. Let me check that I did not miss anything. Mm -hmm. I missed one thing, <laughs> which I will talk about right now. So, note that the diameter written as d kappa of the model space m n kappa can be given as follows. So d kappa is, is the diameter. You just simply take the supremum of distance between two points in the space, in the, in the model space. And you will find that the diameter will be plus infinity if kappa is less than or equals to zero. And the diameter will be, okay, if kappa equals to one, then it's your unit sphere and the diameter is pi. If you shrink or, or ex expand, then it's the matter of square root of kappa. That will change in the diameter because in the diameters, it's a sphere, it's due to the quadratic curve. And this is for kappa positive. Okay, so that's all for the diameter d kappa. Now, the final definition We will have to go deeper into the Alexandrov space as we go on <laughs> to discuss other things. But for today, I only plan to, to give you the definition of an Alexandrov space, okay? So, a metric space, more precisely, a geodesic space. Ooh. A geodesic space X and D is called an Alexandrov space with global curvature. bounded above. Okay, so this is CBA, curvature bounded above. Oh. Let me call it later. Curvature bounded above by kappa in R. If we have this inequality, So now we have to know what u bar and v bar are. I have to also mention u and v here. Focus on me. So if any if for any Continue there.
Okay, so this is essentially the triangle. The definition is quite long if you, sorry. Okay, so you have x u, x bar, u bar. I will explain, do we still have a little bit of time? No. <laughs> okay, so how about continuing this tomorrow? Okay, so sorry guys, uh, I think the time is up for today. Uh, I will continue with this tomorrow. So just give you a very quick word. If you have a triangle x, y, and z in x, you will be able to construct another triangle in the model space of the given curvature for which you have this kind of similarity. And for any u that you picked corresponding to the length here and here, this length between x and u and x bar and u bar, um, distance between this will be shorter than this. So in other words, in a very simple word, the triangle here will be thinner than the triangle in the model space. Okay, so um, I will continue about this definition tomorrow. Um, if you have any questions, just please uh, how, how, how do they give the feedback? <laughs> okay, how about asking me tomorrow? Thanks for coming and see you tomorrow, hopefully. <laughs>